Okay, welcome back. This is uh, Java EE programming, and uh, today we're going to talk about internetworking. Uh, so last week we talked about oh RMI, I believe, and uh, UDP and TCP and a bunch of networking stuff running over IP. So today's lecture is not about IP and inter, uh, excuse me, um, internet working or internet protocols, which IP stands for. So the motivation for internet working or networking itself, uh, the LAN technologies provide high-speed communication across distances, so we're trying to connect um, places that are very far away. Uh, also serves as large areas for WANs themselves. No single network technology is best for all needs. So what we do is we find a common technology, connect, make the connection among all of the different computers, which is the IP, essentially, Internet Protocol, and then connect an internet working or create an internet working environment by assembling different technologies and protocols on the different computers and servers and things and have them all communicate. Um, there's no single networking technology that's best for all needs. So as an example, Ethernet might be best solution for connecting computers in an office and most offices are still using an Ethernet kind of connection. Although a lot of them have gone wireless these days because it's a little cheaper. Ethernet's kind of expensive to install cabling in a building. Um, or another example might be frame relay. That might be the best solution for inter interconnecting in one city to another. You're not going to use frame relay inside of an office. That would be way too expensive. So the foundation for the physical protocols and the physical connections themselves um, are going to need to be dependent on the environment for which they're being used. In terms of a universal service, this allows arbitrary pairs of computers to communicate seamlessly without there being any type of uh, uh, handshake slash translation slash uh, you know interpretation, decoding and encoding and stuff like that. Instead, what we do is just kind of a, and I call it, I like to use the word transparent, but computers that are just transparently connected and they all know about each other. And so it's basically pairs of computers that are communicating together without there being a, a formal uh, connection, but there is a connection. So in terms of the universal service, we've got individual productivity as well and compatibility among different network uh, hardware, physical, you know, addressing prevents universal service to extend across multiple networks or use multiple different technologies. A solution is internetworking versus a universal service. We can't do a universal service, it just doesn't work in reality. Uh, but an internet working does, or the internet. So this word internet working is really a short word, excuse me, a long word for the internet. Because if you take off this working on the end, what do you have the internet? So we're looking at the internet, essentially, and which is the protocol. It's actually, the internet is kind of interesting. It's the generic name that we call the network out there. But it really is a short for the protocol, IP. Uh, internet protocol, which is nothing more than internet working, which is nothing more than la laying down middleware so that everybody can communicate seamlessly. So it provides universal access among heterogeneous networks that are, you know, Macs, PCs, Unix boxes, both hardware and software. It's not restricted in size, obviously. It can grow endlessly. Um, so we have the concept of the router that is used in an internet working environment. And I'm going to assume that everyone in here has had an undergraduate course in networking or internet working. So I'm just, this is like a refresher, uh, refresher slash add a few things to your background knowledge in terms of the concepts. So I'm going to go through this kind of fast actually. Uh, so stop me or slow me down if you want more information on something. But I'm going to assume this is not brand new to you. <coughs> the concept of the router, we've all heard of those things hopefully. Uh, the basic hardware component that connects to heterogeneous networks. And if you think about the concept of the internet, it's a bunch of routers all connected together, if you think about it. Uh, convenient for processors uh, and memory, as well as separate I.O. interfaces and for each one of the networks themselves. <coughs> so you can connect LANs and WANs and MANs and all those HANs and all those different things together. And the routers make that seamless connectivity between the different parts of the network. And you can interconnect networks that use different technologies, media, physical dressing, Frame formats, all sorts of different things. And here's a, a router picture with a LAN and a MAN connected together. In terms of the internet architecture, it consists of sets of networks interconnected by the networks. <laughs> so, what, I mean, you know, I say, what is the network? This is really a, that's a loaded question. 
you know, it's a combination of all of the different pieces and components, mostly routers. I would say routers make up the network. So commercial routers <coughs> can connect more than one or, you know, more than two networks together. Single routers are seldom used because they have a CPU and memory that's inefficient, uh, redundant, redundancy, uh, improves internet reliability, uh, usually. And uh, the internet scheme all allows you to choose the number of types of networks, the number of routers, the exact interconnection topology. So this is what a lot of networking people do, is they sit around thinking, well, how many routers do we need? How should we sub subnet this? How, you know, do we want to create this building and then connect the other building to it, or do we want something else connecting to it? Um, so here's a picture of a, a router out here connecting a WAN and a LAN and a MAN all together, essentially. And then we have this concept of the virtual network. The virtual network, uh, so it's the offers universal service. Each computer is assigned an address and can communicate with any other computer on there. And the internet is a virtual network system. You might actually want to say that, you know, another five years from now, we won't be talking about virtual networks anymore. Everything will be cloud, if the cloud word sticks, actually. Because um, this is sort of like a cloud. It's a virtual network. Well, a cloud, it's a bunch of servers connected together. So it's a virtual network, essentially, uh, providing its own services. And when you log in, let's say this was network one, two, three, four, physically broken out. You can see that on the bottom piece of the slide here. It kind of looks like a cloud, too, actually. <laughs> if you look at this here, <clears throat> we're not logging into, let's say, network one, two, three, or four. Instead, all of them are shared together in terms of uh, this resource that's been created, which is what we're commonly referring to as a cloud these days. Some of this might be for file storage, some of it might be for content delivery, uh, for services, for applications, for programs and things. But you've got multiple computers or servers, I should say, networked together to provide this you know, quote-unquote cloud, which is really nothing new if you think about it. It's a, it's a virtual network of the old days. <clears throat> so the protocols, which is really the focus of today's lecture, TCP IP, which we looked at already in terms of the programming language interface, widely used as well uh, for internetworking, still used as well, although hardly anyone creates a, t a socket and does the lower level abstractions these days, and unless you're creating your own network program, which a lot of people still do. It's the layer model, uh, contains the five different layers, also called internet, the IP, so what we have is the physical layer, the network interface layer, uh, the internet, the transport, and the application. This is the five-layer model versus the seven-layer model of the OSI. We went over that a couple weeks ago, I believe. The four layers here, when we talk about TCP, we're primarily concerned with, actually, this is really more of the, the five-layer model and the TCP is more of a DOD, Department of Defense standard, actually, um, versus an OSI. Although the two of them overlap in terms of the functionality, because both of them use IP. And uh, the ISO model has no internet layer, per se, but the DOD model does, which is kind of interesting. Instead, they have a network, and then they have a transport, and they're missing the internet in the middle of it. So DOD, all they did was they shortened it a little bit, added an internet layer, call it IP. I'm not going to go through this because you guys have seen this already, but the TCPIP model, sometimes referred to as the DOD model, this slide set is calling it a TCPIP model, and it looks very similar. In fact, the, the meanings of the different layers are the same as the OSI model we went over already, but with the addition of this internet layer, uh, which basically sets the format for the IP protocol. So I'm going to kind of skip through this as well to save you guys from boredom. And I'm going to totally repeat your class, your undergraduate course. But let's talk about addressing for a few minutes. And then what I want to get into is the differences between IP4 and IP6, and you know what what is I, what makes IP IP you know in terms of the technology. Because this is what we're looking at in terms of uh, EE Enterprise Edition. Um, so addressing is uh, merely an abstraction created entirely by software. Actually, addressing addressing is all by software actually, which is why it can change. It's not hardware driven. Although on an Ethernet network, we do have MAC addresses that get tied in with Ethernet packets, which is different than IP packets. But on an IP network, we don't actually know your MAC address. 
we don't have to know it because we're not we're not on a local LAN area. We're on an IP area network. So guarantees uniform. The addressing itself guarantees uniform addressing protocols. Uniform addressing helps to create the illusion of a large seamless network. Okay, it's kind of like your house addresses. Uh, in fact, the internet addressing scheme is exactly like your house addresses. We have a, your name, we have your street address, your city, your state, your zip code. Well, we have your subnet, your net, <laughs> your local, your DNS assigned address. We have all that stuff included in that IP address that we're using. But instead of looking for a house, we're looking for you on your computer. So it's translated into that. So in terms of the IP scheme, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything there. No, nope, I didn't. Specific towards IP, it's actually invented for IP. It doesn't exist outside of the IP concept. And it's IP, this is based on IP4, this lecture, this, this slide right here, where it gives us a unique 32-bit binary number used for all the communication with the host. Uh, each 32-bit address is divided into two parts, prefix and a suffix, kind of like a telephone number, actually, a numbering system. Unique value assigned to each one of the physical networks. So it's a hierarchy. It guarantees that each computer is assigned a unique address and the suffixes can be assigned locally without global coordination. Uh, because everybody's uh, local uh, subnet address, post uh, address is, uh, host address is going to be different. It's going to be unique. <coughs> so we ended up with different classes. So the class of the address determines the boundary between the network prefix and the host prefix. Uh, so we basically just took all the addresses and subdivided them out into different categories and assigned them per category. And uh, there's actually a Windows command that you can actually, on your network at home, type in and you can see what class your, your addressing scheme is. And it used to be in the old days it meant something, now it doesn't mean anything at all. All the classes are sort of blurred together. But some of them had a better quality of service, they had faster speeds sometimes. Um, because it meant, you know, certain classes had more traffic, had more addresses. So the more addressing you have per class, the more uh, the router actually has to work to resolve the address. Uh, so ends up in situations where you're, um, it's almost like home service. I mean, the more, you, the more you have, the longer it is to look it up in terms of a search algorithm. So IP divides the host address into primary classes A, B, and C. The first four bits of the address determine the class, uh, which is going to be uh, the first four bits of the address. Using the IP multicast, a set of hosts must agree to share the multicast address. So everybody's familiar with the addressing scheme. We have the class uh, that's designated, which really isn't used for very much anymore. In the old days, it was used for a lot, actually. And then we can compute the class, actually, from your IP address. The, there's a, tons of utilities, actually, where you can just run a program and it'll tell you from your IP address what class you're on. Um, or you can do it manually. If you're going to do it manually, your IP addresses are self-identifying. So the class of the address is computed from the address itself, from the bit translation. So you have to take the, the address, translate it into bits, take the first four bits, compare it against the index. And then you get the class. So if it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 15, you know, it's going to equate down to something. And then you get the, the class levels in terms of what. And the class in the, in the old days used to mean something. It told you what type of computer you were, <laughs> where you were coming from. Now, not so, much, not so much of a big deal anymore. We're all familiar with the dotted notation. The dotted notation it gives us the syntax for the IP address when using to inter interact with humans because nobody understands this. Actually, here it is. There. Nobody understands this, but we understand this because it's numbers. Um, you could actually use this. You could actually use the binary interpretation. In fact, there's some geeky web browsers out there <laughs> that you can type in a bunch of ones and zeros, and it'll take you to Yahoo or something or Google. You know, it's like okay, whatever. Uh, actually, there's a lot of people out there that like to use the addresses for Yahoo and Google because uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you when you type in Google.com or www or all the HTTPs and all that stuff. Nowadays, the web browser just takes the name.com. Actually, pretty soon it'll just take the name. I hope uh, you type in Google and. Uh, that actually is a, the domain name regist registration that's linked to about, oh, I don't know, probably about 10,000, 20,000 IP addresses, I would say, 
depends on how big they are. I have no idea. That's a guess. That's probably it. That's probably an overestimate. Maybe it's under a thousand servers that they have. They probably have like 500 servers, maybe. I don't know. Depends on how much web traffic they have. There are some geeky people that like to go and just type in the addresses to go to one of the servers <laughs> instead of going to the one that you actually get routed to for load balancing. So you can actually do that if you wanted to. Um, because these addresses are resolving to the name and the name is translating. And depending upon which server has more traffic, you're going to be routed to one that has less traffic, hopefully. So you're going to guarantee quality of service. That's how they do what's called load balancing for their server traffic. Uh, but you could violate their load balancing by using the IP addresses and going to one in particular, actually. Usually the ones that you can find most commonly on the internet are over traffic because people are doing that. So they're, they're busy anyway. You get better service if you just use google.com. So. <laughs> Uh, so you can express each one of the 8 bits into a 32-bit as a decimal value, is what we've done here, using the decimals to separate the octets. So the class is recognized by the decimal value of the first. So the 192, the 128 is going to give us. So anyone who's on a 192, you're on a class B network. Yeah. I think that's, we're like at a 7-something here. We're like a 7-2-something at, at, at this school. Um, and I've looked at the raw IP address here. Um, which is kind of interesting. It doesn't fit into any of the classes. So. Hmm, probably does. It's probably a class C. <coughs> so the classes do not contain the same type of network, theoretically. Uh, a, B's, and C's, the number of networks, the num n maximum number, oops, the maximum number of networks, the C's are going to have more on them. Uh, so the A's are not going to have as many. The bits in terms of the bits and the suffix and the maximum number of hosts per network, there's a lot more hosts on an A than there is on a C. So the 192.168, which is going to be your local host, uh, no, it's going to be a B network. So a B network is going to be kind of, you know, in the middle in terms of the flip. So each network prefix must be unique. So the network prefix is unique. An organization contains network numbers from their ISPs. ISPs coordinate with central office. The internet assigns a number through the number authority, and the number authority keeps track of the numbers. So it's kind of like zip codes, actually. You know, everybody's in the 195, something or other. It just tells you what, what network you're on. And then in there you have a street name and you have a street address, which is pretty much the same as the IP. So in our IP example here, from prefix 128.10, we've got 01. O2, which are going to be two separate networks off of that. And then on our 128.211, we've got, again, more networks that are branched off of that from a Class B or a Class C, which is the 192 uh, in this example. Excuse me. Yeah, 192 over here. Or the A, which is the 10s. Actually, we're on an A here, by the way. This is an A network over here because we do have a 10. The router is on a 10. So. I got that wrong. I thought we were seven. Actually, the the domains start out seven to eight, I think, but we're on a ten dot something here. So. Easy to do that. Actually, just type in IF config or IP config, depending upon what computer you're on, and take a look at your subnet, <laughs> and it'll tell you what class you're on. Actually, uh, so in terms of special IP addresses, IP uh, defines a set of special addresses uh, forms that are uh, reserved. And all zeros, mm, so it's this computer, it's like the 127.00.0.0. So that's the 000s. It's going to be your local host, actually. Uh, the net for all zeros for that, the suffix. Um, the net itself plus all zeros, the network identifies the network itself, the 127. Uh, the network itself with all ones, direct broadcasts the limited broadcast or 127 any is the loop back for testing. So this is this is actually the 127 prefix is your local host loop back to actually loop to yourself. So when you use local host it's 127.00.0 or 00. Dot whatever. Everything's zero except for the 127. <laughs> so routers and IP addresses. So you can actually use this for testing purposes. In fact a lot of network professionals, you know, they make up these addresses um, you know to, for testing to to kind of see what's going on, to test the router, to test uh, to test different computers to see if they're connected. 
In terms of the routers, each IP address identifies a connection between the computer and the network itself. So each router is assigned two or more IP addresses. And the IP does not require the same suffix be assigned to all of the interfaces of the router. You can have different suffixes assigned. So here we have an internet channel with a 131 coming through with a 223 on a token ring network that's coming into a router that's on a 78. So and then we have the WAN out here that's on a 78. So we can connect different types of subnets together. They don't all have to be the same, um, which is nice. And the purpose of the router is that it's the router has a table on there that looks up directions. And it says, it's almost like a traffic cop. It says you can go this way, you go that way. And all it does is direct traffic depending upon the IP address. Because the IP packet has the destination address in there, looks at the destination address, looks at the network, and says, you're seven eights in that direction. Oh, you go that way. You're one nine twos, you go that way. And it directs your traffic according to what your IP address on the destination packet in the, in the header of the IP packet, whatever it says, the router picks that up, looks at it, and takes and routes your packet in the right direction. Multi-homed host. Uh, so a multi-homed is a host that connects to multiple networks. So for increased reliability, if one network fails, the host can still reach the network through a second connection, another multiple host. Increases performance. Traffic can be directed to avoid congestion on routers. And it has multiple addresses, one for each one of the networks that's connected. It's like a multi-host. So protocol addressing. So a frame that is transmitted across a physical network must contain the hardware address on a physical network, which is kind of different than IP, which is a non-physical. IP is a software network. So on an Ethernet, physical connected computers, and let me rephrase that. It actually has nothing to do with the physical connection. <laughs> it has something to do with um, the protocol that's being used to establish the connection. IP alone, it's a software-based protocol. Um, if we mix it in with an Ethernet packet and we run Ethernet over IP or we run both of them together, then we're looking at a hardware address, something that's made from the hardware. And the address is actually imprinted on the network card, the, the NIC card that's in the computer, the network interface card. In fact, your, your wireless card has a MAC address on it as well. And so does your internal in your notebook itself. And even though you don't necessarily have a separate NIC card, you might have it on board, it still have a MAC address on there. Because that MAC address needs to be used for Ethernet. Um, also, it's not very it's not used very much in IP, but it's used for other physical types of networks. So uh peer to peer networking with Microsoft, stuff like that, it's still being used with that. Um, so the net next hop, the packet destination address or the are the IP addresses that are still being in combination with the physical hardware address. Mac network addresses do not understand IP addressing. It's two separate worlds. Uh, so a frame sent across a given physical network must use the hardware's frame format and use the hardware um, addresses that are associated with it. Which is kind of interesting because when we think of frames, we think of, um, I always think of physical networks and I always think of packets as software abstraction of frames, but we have frames inside of packets when we send them. So address resolution. So mapping between the protocol address and the hardware address, the address resolution is a local is local to the network, uh, which is kind of interesting. So if you have a dynamically assigned address on an IP network, your address is local to your network, meaning my address here might be, and this would be my last three digits of my IP, might be 206, 106, 107. You may also have a 106, a 107, a 206, or any one of the combinations of those three numbers on yours, but it's local to your network. So there's no conflict in terms of my address and your address matching, which is how we can reuse those numbers. You don't normally run out with, with 1,000 addresses, you know, well, plus you have times three combinations. So you, it's actually... Um, a lot of addresses <laughs> you're never going to run out on your local network. So a computer never resolves the address of the computer that attaches to the remote network. It doesn't have to. Each computer handles a packet resolved on a next hop addressing before it is sent. So if we go from A, B, C, D, router number one, router number two, the router is the only one who looks at the subnet 
it goes to here or it goes to here. And in, in between your local assigned address, your last three characters are going to do the routing here. And there's no lookup that's needed for a, um, for a global um, routing system. So if you can shortchange, long story short, if you can divide it out, shortchange the protocols for each of the different subnets and different parts of the addressing. You don't have to deal with all of it. You only deal with the piece that's associated with the functionality that you're interested in performing. So if you're just doing a simple message exchange within the same network, you don't need any of the network and any of the host information. All you need is the local DNS resolution. Which is interesting because if you get little routers, um, wireless routers are a good example. If you're going to do a wireless router, put it you know, behind the access point. Access point is going to be the router that's going to be interested in the host. Uh, the little wireless thing is going to run a lot faster. It doesn't have to do any lookup at all. It just goes 102 to 103 to 104. So you can print to your printer faster. You can, if you put it behind the access point and don't use it as your main router, it actually makes it so it runs a little bit efficient, more efficiently in terms of its connectivity uh, because there's no address resolution it has to find. It's like going outside and coming back in. It's just inside. So What you don't want to do is design a network system that always has to go out and come back in. Why? You know, you're just printing next door to you. <laughs> so... Depending upon how you have it configured, you might be going along all the way around the world. It's like when you send a send a, a letter from Southern California to Northern California, and it goes to New York first. Why is it going to New York? And the local telephone, the, the local post office should recognize it's going within California and put it over into the local pile, and so it doesn't have to go back to a central hub somewhere in the middle of the world. So, which is kind of interesting if you think of it, it's actually it's like. IP addressing is sort of like um, package handling, <laughs> if you think about it. Because all packets go to a certain place first. Well, they're going to go to your ISP, and your ISP is going to send it off to other locations. So if you send a message, if you send a Federal Express overnight package to somebody in the world, it's probably going to go to Texas or Colorado first, depending upon where the hub's located. And then it goes to the central sorting facility. <laughs> and then it turns around and comes back to California. <laughs> but it has to go to the central, so, you know, has to go to the central place to get sorted. So actually, IP networks work the same way. You're going to your host wherever your host happens to be, and then the host is going to turn around, and send it back to California, send it back to where you are. So address resolution techniques. This is where it all happens. This is what happens at the sorting facility. So it depends on the protocol and the hardware and the addressing scheme. We could have a table lookup. And this is where, like, uh, this is where some of the new stuff comes into play. So to supplement your background so far, to say, what if I was going to build my own address resolution technique, and I wanted to make this more efficient? So I could use a couple of different techniques. These are three kind of popular ones that have been experimented with. A lot of people, a lot of routers, a lot of addressing resolution is done with table lookups because it just proves to be a little bit easier a little bit more straightforward in terms of the implementation. So the bindings or the mappings are stored in a table in memory, usually the router table. And the software searches when it needs to resolve an address, finds it, and hello, you've got the address that is, needs to be resolved. We could do what's called a closed form computation. And if we do that, the computer's hardware address can be computed from the protocol address using a basic Boolean or arithmetic expression. Most of your your Novell, your well, the Novell is still in business anymore, I don't know, but a lot of the older uh, network operating systems did more of a closed form computation because they had Ethernet packets and they were computing Ethernet hardware addresses on MAC addresses and the resolution was faster because you, if you don't have as many, you only have a hundred or something. I mean, how many computers you're going to have connected in a company? Probably like 100, 150, one per each employee, maybe in a small business office. If you did a closed form computation, it might actually run faster. There's no need to create an elaborate table and index it. And then you've got tons of data to go through. Or you could do a message exchange, which is uh, like the peer to peer networking and the token ring type environment where computers exchange messages across a network to resolve an address like a broadcast, to go out and say, hey, are you out there? Who's out there? 
I am. Okay. Are you the person I'm looking for? Yeah. Okay. Which is uh, kind of like the, the ring, token ring. And I sent it around to everybody. No, this is not mine. Okay, send it over. Not mine. Send it over. Not mine. And the package just floated around the network till somebody picked it up, essentially. So the table lookup technique, uh, very popular. The table consists of an array containing our some sort of a data structure implementation, not necessarily implemented like a traditional style array. It can be a dynamic one. Containing a pair of protocols and equivalent hardware addresses, a separate binding table is used uh, for each one of the physical networks. Uh, so for small networks, uh, we've got a sequential search that is used. Kind of slow, actually, for small networks. Uh, if you're sequentially going through, are you number one, are you number two, are you number three, are you number four, mm, it can be kind of hard. For larger networks, you do caching or you, you use direct indexing, which is sort of similar to database database concepts. You're going to index a table if it's going to be big, so that you don't have to go through all the data in the table. You're just going to find where you're at and easily look it up. Uh, so a lot of the, um, the router tables are indexed or they're hashed, uh, so it makes it easier for lookup. So we've got IP addresses, and then we've got hardware addresses. What's this doing? It's telling the um, the router where your computer is on this particular network once it makes it to your local network. So there's a translation that's associated with this. So if you ever go into your router software, you'll see this you'll see this mapping going on. Actually, anybody ever configure a wireless router or a wired router? If you log into the if the router itself, all you do is you you can actually label these if you wanted to. You can actually pick up... Wireless networking is a little easier, actually, these days uh, for some strange reason. You go in there and you can look at the who's connected, look at the hardware address or the MAC address, actually, which is of your card. Your wireless card is broadcasting that, actually. And then you map it, and you can actually set, set particular IP addresses so they never change if you want. Allow, disallow, you know, allow only these computers, only those computers. So hopefully you are doing that if you have your own wireless network. Otherwise, everybody in your neighborhood is on your, on your network. So now The easiest thing, though, is to bypass all of this stuff and just set a wet password. But then it makes it uh, in a large environment where you got a lot of people connected. It, uh, it's better to set a wet just Just put a password on there. Uh, a WAP, excuse me. Set, set a password on there to, you know, before people connect versus going through... MAC address, MAC address, MAC address. Accept these MAC addresses, don't accept anything else, kind of thing. All right, so closed form <coughs> technique. Uh, when you have a, uh, some technologies that are configurable addressing themselves, so a local area network administrator chooses both hardware and an IP address as an example. So to calculate out the, um, the location given the address. So closed form method computes a mathematical function that maps the IP address to the hardware address itself. The values are chosen to optimize the translation. As an example, we have the host portion of the IP computer's IP address that can be chosen to be identical to the computer's um, hardware address. So computer address is equal to IP address. And then you have a pretty easy translation because they're the same. So, In terms of the message exchange technique, to resolve an address, send a message across the network and receive a reply. So you're broadcasting a message to all of the people on the network, and someone comes back and says, hey, that's me. Okay, so the message carrier protocol address is used, and your reply carries a hardware address associated with it. Whoever replied back, you pull the hardware address off of that message, and then you know where the message is supposed to go. So an address resolution request is sent to one or more uh, resolution servers or each computer on a network. And then we have type of resolution, you know, useful for any, and these are some features down here, don't worry about the different types. So, the basic addressing scheme is the purpose of this lecture. So. Then we have ARP, ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Uh, so this is actually still being used. The ARP standard defines two basic message types, a request and a response, and this is the basis actually for TCP implementation. Uh, if you ever notice and uh, there's so much more messaging going back and forth between a TSP. There's a you know, request for a connection. Okay, you can connect. Okay, establish my connection. <sighs> so you got like a three-way. And then to disconnect, you got two or three different messages. I think it's two messages for disconnect, three to connect. Um, but the sending and receiving of the resolution, the address resolution protocol, 
is what's uh, used for the address resolution. So ARP requests a message containing an IP address. It's placed in a hardware frame and then broadcast to all computers. A response contains both an IP and a hardware address, but it is not broadcast. Instead, the response goes back to the host who actually sent out the message. So we have a request that comes out of here. It goes to everybody, and then the response comes back in from the W from Y to W because this was the the guy who actually belongs to us. It's almost like, you know, if I yelled out into room, hey, whose student ID is 119 something or other? And then one student stands up, hey, that's me. <laughs> not all of you are going to respond back, no, that's not me, no, that's not me. <laughs> Although, in, an, in a perfect environment, that is what's going to happen. I mean, you're going to get one person who responds. Unfortunately, it's kind of like those nasty email messages when everyone has to reply back, no, not me. Okay, who cares? Just like the real person, you respond back. So, ARP message format, the ARP standard here describes <coughs> the general form of the ARP message, specifies how to determine uh, the details of each one of the types of networking addresses. ARP is almost always used in a 32-bit IP address to a 48-bit Ethernet address translation. So we have the hardware address type, the protocol address type, the header for the length, the header, the padding length, you know, how many how much padding do we have to the, to the message itself, the operation, the senders, the receiver, all the different information on the header, and I've got some more information on headers in a few minutes. In terms of the ARP message format, the encapsulation, placing a message inside a frame for transport, there's the frame data area that's inside the ARP message, so it's encapsulated uh, directly in the hardware frame. So the hardware frames are formatted for hardware networks transporting over Ethernet um, or another protocol, so it's short. So the type of frame and the frame head, the type of field in the frame header specifies that the frame contains an ARP message. So t in the format of the frame, we know what's inside of it and what format's being used in terms of its encoding and decoding, in terms of, or not really encoding and decoding, although we can apply encryption to this but it's mostly for being able to read the appropriate data and know what kind of data is actually in the packet. It does not distinguish between a request and a response. They're both the same kind of thing. So, so caching ARP messages. Three packets traverse the network for each ARP transmission. To reduce traffic, ARP software extracts and saves the information. ARP manages a table as a cache. So it uses binding if present without transmitting a request. So it binds it and if the binding is not present, it will broadcast a request, wait for a response, update the cache, proceed to use the bindings if it exists. So. And kind of an important side note to take in consideration, why in the world are we covering this stuff? Well, <laughs> what if you want to read an IP packet? <laughs> what if you want to know? This gives you sort of some background into what's involved in, from a programmer's perspective in terms of translating this stuff. It's not a bad idea to be familiar with the format of this stuff, because then you know how to read stuff from it. Like, what if you were going to write software that worked on a router? You're going to have to read those packets. And lucky for you, there's a lot of, believe it or not, there's a lot of Java utilities out there that read packets. And you can create all sorts of sophisticated programs to do load balancing and stuff, or to do other utilities on your network, in your enterprise environment, to route traffic like a router would, uh, make requests from a lower level implementation, um, and then you, we, we get a bunch of higher level uh, protocols that are built upon this. And we're going to look at um, the Java name uh, lookup system, and we're, gonna, we're leading into in the next couple weeks some more EE features that are going to look at routing, you know, looking at the packets themselves, the naming convention, resolving addresses and stuff like that. Uh, so this is the foundational stuff for it, uh, or the old-time way of doing things, I should say. But it's kind of like looking at UDP and TCP. It's the older way of doing RMI, <laughs> so it puts it in perspective for the most part. So processing an ARP message, the receiver must perform two basic steps. Extract the sender's addressing, address binding and check to see if it's present. Determine whether the message is a request or a response, because they both look the same. After the computer replies to the ARP request, the computer extracts the sender's addressing, uh, address binding. 
Optimization is done because most computers communicate involve a two-way traffic. So we have both directions going. And a computer cannot store an arbitrary number of address bindings. So it might have limited resources. So layering and addressing in terms of the address resolutions associated with the network interface layer of the OSI model, and also the network layer or the internet layer of the DOD model or TCP model. So the address resolution <coughs> hides the details of the physical addressing because it's using the physical addressing. So going back to the model itself from an internet perspective or from a networking perspective, it picks up the lower level information from the lower levels in the hierarchy, like the MAC address as an example from a physical layer, encapsulates that into its protocol, and then sends it up to the transport layer. Because once you have the foundation for the packet, for the, for the um, enclosing, or if you call it a frame, call it a packet, call it whatever it is that's going to be transported, sometimes you have frames inside of packets, but long story short, the transport layer is going to need all that stuff. And the transport layer is your TCP or your RMI or your UDP or whatever it happens to be located on top of IP. So it's going to take that information and that's where the address is coming from. So you actually have been reading IP packets. You've been reading datagram packets. When you sent that UDP message back and forth and it was a text message, the packet that was encapsulated in the IP that was transporting the hello from this computer to that computer that went through the port that got abstracted and got put into the little byte array. Well, the address that was pulled out of that came from the packet. So the API that you used on the, from the Java perspective worked on a lower level system call that actually looked at the packet itself and transport and uh, uh, dissected the packet information to, to pull out the sender's, the sender's address and ports. So the address resolution software hides the details of the physical addressing applications of the higher level protocol software are built to use the, the protocol addressing only. So at a certain level you can kind of get rid of you can kind of get rid of some of the abstraction as you go up. And from a TCP level, you're just looking at the packet. You don't care where the information came from from the packet. And then above the TCP level, from the application level, from an RMI perspective, you're just loading an RMI server. You don't care that it's running on TCP or over IP. If the TCP and the IP weren't there, the RMI is not going to work. But it doesn't really matter at that point in terms of your programming abstraction. So virtual packets. So TCP IP designers include protocols for both connectionless and connection-oriented services, what we saw actually last week or the week before, UDP and TCP type of protocols for transport. And those are transport protocols. They're not IP. They're not network protocols. Applications progr programs remain unaware of the underlying physical networks. So the router forwards each packet from one network to another. doesn't know what it's being used for. The packet itself is in the same format. Uh, so one of the interesting differences, however, is the streaming versus the datagram that we looked at. So the datagrams themselves are complete units. The streaming is numbered. It's 1 of 5, 2 of 5, 3 of 5, 4 of 5, 5 of 5 that comes through. And then, but they're all packets. They're all the same format. But they're streamed. So the streaming is just this one leads to this one leads to this one. So it's a numbering sequence. No fixed frame format because routers can connect heterogeneous networks. There's no frame format that's fixed. Universal virtual format or packet an internet packet format independent of the hardware itself. So in terms of the IP datagram, this is our, you know, our lower level UDP datagram packet that we're sending. The packet is sent across TCP IP network actually. Um, so this is the same format we're going to use whether we use a UDP or a TCP connection. Each datagram consists of a header followed by the data. So the source and the destination address in the datagram packet are IP addresses. So the size of the datagram packet actually is variable. Some packets are bigger than other packets, actually. Um, so it makes for IP adaptable to various different types of applications. And here's a kind of an example of this IP datagram. Where we have the datagram area, excuse me, the data area that's going to hold a hello world or whatever it is text message we're sending along with the header information. The header information is going to be used by the routers. 
So forwarding an IP datagram, datagram they do uh, they traverse from source to destinations through routers so that the router keeps track of the information in the router table, as we mentioned before, the table concept. Each destination listed in the router table is a network, not an individual host. So in our router table, we have destination network 1, network 2, network 3, and then we have the next loop, deliver directly, deliver directly, or go to router 1, go to router 2. And it, it's kind of like a way of, of predetermining what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, and it's sort of like a linked list. A lot of ways. So routers are sort of like nodes in a link list. They know the next, they know the next, they know the next, but they don't know the final destination. And they may not necessarily know the previous. So they're sort of a singly link list in concept from a computer science perspective. So in terms of the table entries, so in practice IP routing table is complex and it contains the destination field, obviously, uh, so each entry contains a network prefix for the destination address. Need to know that. Need to know where it's going. And an address mask that specifies which bit of the destination corresponds to the network or prefix. We need to know that one as well. And then the next hop, specifying the IP address of the router. So we're going router to router to router until the router decides it doesn't need to go to a router anymore. And then the router goes elsewhere. So routers keep track of routers. So in terms of your networking, the best thing to do is optimize your routers, right? <laughs> so what's going to determine the speed of the network? The routers. <laughs> how many routers you're going through and how fast the routers are and whether or not the router is up to date. So if you get a router that's not up to date, that thinks that there's other routers that are alive and active but those routers are no longer there, you have slow, bad, unreliable traffic because it'll just bounce around all over the place until it finally gets to the destination. Hopefully. If not, it just gets lost in the router. It's kind of like when you uh, rely on the GPS to take you from point A to point B and it sends you in a circle because it doesn't know about some street or some road that's closed and you go to the, ro the road that's closed and it wants you to take it but you can't get on the road so it reroutes you around in a circle to go back to the road but it doesn't know that the road's closed. Routers do that all the time, actually. Uh, so, and if you think about the concept, nobody owns the network. The network's owned by everybody. Not one individual owns the network. There was a ledge down there. Okay, so. <laughs> um, and so not everybody has the same quality of equipment or maintenance or the abilities to, uh, you know, provide what's needed for certain type of connectivity, so. But as we uh, have progressed through time, the quality of routers have really improved. So now we have a lot of intelligent routers as well that can go out and see if something is down. So router table entries, routing and forwarding. So the process is using a route, router routing table to select the next hop or the next like, location. And then the mask field provides a network part of the address during the lookup. So software computes uh, the boolean or the mask that the destination for the destination datagram. Uh, so if looking at this, we're gonna if this is equal to the destination router that we need to go to, then forward it to the next hop. Set the next hop to the next location. So the destination addresses the datagram header always refers to multiple different addresses that it's going to go to because it doesn't really go from point A to point B. It goes from point A to B to C to D to E to F to G then to E wherever it actually ends up at. So the, the datagram packet might be forwarded to another router. Datagram header remains in terms of the destination address. Always stays the same. Unless you have a router that is um, spoofing traffic and changing destination addresses. And then you've got situations where you're losing packets because they're all going to one location instead of where they're supposed to be going. Best effort delivery. So the IEP is designed to operate over all the types of networks and hardware and it creates a universal network system. So it uses the term best effort to describe the service that it offers. It makes the best effort attempt, which means it's going to hopefully deliver, but it's not guaranteed. It cannot handle the following problems. Datagram duplication, duplicate packets, delayed or out of order delivery sometimes, corruption of data, datagram loss, 
loss packets. It doesn't know how to recover from that. So additional layers of protocol are needed to handle each of these errors. So in terms of the IP diagram header format, we can keep track of how many packets are involved. Uh, we can do checks on the packet, checksums and stuff like that. So each field and diagram packet header has a fixed size associated with it. And this is where we're getting into the differences between IP4 and IP6. We started out with a certain format and then we decided we ran out of room. We needed more flexibility. So there's actually now extra room in IP6 to add in more information. There's more room in the header. So we can design specialized protocols and applications that work with that. The problem with IP4, the way it sits right now, and this is an IP4 header packet, excuse me, datagram packet. Problem with it is that there's no room for growth. We can use it with current technologies that we have designed this for, but we're stuck. So everybody who's doing something brand new and improved is using an IP6 packet format. The only problem is IP6 is not supported everywhere. Because if you think about the concept, if the packet is formatted in a certain way and your router only reads IP4 packets and it gets tossed an IP6 packet, it's probably not going to know what to do with it. So then it's not going to be able to route it. So we aren't completely consistent at this point. So a lot of people are still doing backward compatible IP4. So datagram transmission and encapsulation, the network hardware does not understand datagram format or internet addressing in terms of the encapsulation, the entire diagram is placed inside the data area of the frame. And then the destination address in the frame is the address of the next hop. So the destination gets put inside. So think of this as a uh, layered packet with things that are subdivided and placed inside of each one of these different sections to support the lower level protocols, the addressing, the MAC addressing, the hardware addressing that might be supported through the IP as well should be supported, I should say. So the address is obtained by translating the IP address to an equivalent hardware address in terms of the way that's routed. So here's the transmission across the internet. What's going on here? We have when a diagram packet arrives in a f network frame, uh, it receives the uh, receive, receiver extracts the datagram, discards the frame header, doesn't need it anymore. It's already arrived at its source. Uh, so we have the destination host down here, we have the source host up here, we have the datagram that's created, it goes from network one with a header, goes through the router, goes through network two, the next header that's been basically slapped on here to update it. Say, hey, we made it this far, now we're going, because if you think of the concept, the source is here, now the source is here, now the source is here, now the source is here. Eventually when it reaches its destination, we don't need that header anymore, because we already have, you know, we have already reached our final destination. So maximum transmission unit and datagram size. So the maximum amount of data that a frame can carry is its MTU, maximum transmission unit. So for encapsulation, diagram must be smaller uh, or, or of the e equal to the network MTU. So it can't be larger than the network MTU. So a lot of the times the MTU is fixed as something that's manageable by the average network in terms of where you're going, where this network because you don't know everybody's network MTU. So you can design particular MTUs for different types of networks as long as you know that this is what, what, what will work. If you're designing your own, if you're going to design your own datagrams, which is you can actually, there's no set standard. I guess there is a set standard, there's no rule that says you can't design your own. Uh, in fact, if you think of the concept, that's what happened with email. Those are data datagram packets, but it's a special design of them. It's a, it's a changed, it's a totally different protocol completely. But it's an extension on the concept. You're sending something to a mail server, you know, acts like a router actually. It takes the header of that information and routes it to another mail server, to another mail server, until it actually ends up to your mail server. If you've ever looked at the, um, the email itself, the header part of it, which you can extract, you'll see all the hops you'll see every place it went, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And you can see exactly where it was sent from physically, from what location, usually a city, a state, actually, depending upon which host it was actually sent to first. So in terms of fragmentation, an IP router divides a larger diagram into smaller pieces called fragments for going over an IP network. 
uh, which is where we get, you know, piece one of two, two of two, three of two, or one of two, one of three, two of three, three of three, in terms of dissecting it out. Uh, and this was originally done, if you think of the concept, you have all this data and you're going to put it through a, a hose or a pipe. You've got five different pieces, different sources of data. How are you going to make it all fit simultaneously? You can't. So you break it out into smaller pieces and then you put little pieces of everybody's through at the same time. So you, you can share the traffic, you can share the datagram size. So if we break it all out, then we have the reassembly, and this is what happens in the TCP network. So the process is of creating a copy of the original datagram from the fragments. So a fragment can have the same destination address as the original datagram. The ultimate destination host resembles, uh, resembles the fragments because it reduces the amount of state information in the router. It allows routers to change dynamically, given the amount of traffic that's in there. So, in terms of the reassembly, we have from network one going through network two, going through network three. Finally, we've got an accumulation of what came through here and what came through here together. By the time we got to the third host or second, actually second host, second location. And um, identifying a diagram is actually kind of interesting, and the router can accumulate it all and then can deliver it. And then when it delivers it, it might be short a packet. And the packet might actually be on its way, but it got routed to the wrong router or something. Because these are all individual things that are going. So if you've ever watched um, high definition television, everybody's watched television now. If you ever notice in the old days of the broadcast, transmitted aerial transmission, the picture was fuzzy, you know, and maybe it had lines through it. And it was, the transmission was weak from the signal point of view. Now with high definition, what do we get? Square box, black boxes <laughs> that appear on the screen. Or, you know, have you ever seen a picture that it's almost there, but it's all broken up into boxes or into pieces? Usually boxes, actually, because they're broken out as a, like a grid. It's because those are lost datagram packets because it's actually, believe it or not, being transmitted in a very similar way. You break out all the stuff, you throw it through the pipe. At the destination at your TV receiver, it's being reassembled. Depending upon the quality of your service, the speed in which everything is showing up, you might have, ar, 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 ar. It might be jittery. You might have, I usually see black pixels, black dots, you know, dot little squares. And then in a few minutes, they actually fill in. <laughs> sometimes they fill in, sometimes they don't fill in. You're looking at a lost packet, or you're looking at a packet that has come in out of order, or you're looking at a packet that never make it at all. So. so IP does not guarantee delivery because individual fragments can be lost. And it's going over an IP network, actually. So fragments can arrive out of order. And now uh, your digital cable is based on an IP network. It is not exactly like it, but it's very close. In fact, eventually we're going to have convergence of everything. We, well, we have it right now, actually. We have TV sets that support the Internet and high-definition television at the same time. Uh, because it's, it's like voice over IP. It's the same concept. Take telephone, put it over an IP network. What do you get with a voice over IP call that doesn't work out right? You get... Uh, hello. Uh, it's jittery because the packets aren't arriving in a s s constant, uh, what do you call it, stream. There's breaks in between the delivery of the packets, so the voice is broken up sometimes. Yeah. All right, so, so <coughs> sender places a unique identification number in, in each one of the outgoing datagrams. The receiver uses the identification number and the IP address, the source address, to determine the datagram to which the fragment belongs. And then we have the fragment offset field, which tells the receiver how to order the fragments within a given diagram packet. So fragment lost is the encapsulated diagram where the fragment can be lost or delayed. It's that little black box that appears on your screen somewhere. Sometimes you get more than one. You know, if you get one black box, you're lucky. You probably won't see it. Usually you get like dozens of them. and Sometimes they're all in one little area of the screen too, which is weird. The receiver holds fragments until all fragments arrive. I we didn't well, eventually um, time out. IP specifies the maximum time to hold the fragments, and then the IP reassembles, uh, 
reassembly, the timer is all or nothing. So the Ethernet, either all of the frames arrive or the IP discards the uh, complete datagram. Uh, it wouldn't work so well if we discarded everything. So the way cable broad, the, the way that the cable system is working, it's it's not discard it, just let it go through. But it looks like you know, it doesn't look too good <laughs> when you get it. So it's possible to uh, further. It, it is possible to further fragment. So you can fragment the fragments if you wanted to make them even smaller. IP does not distinguish between original segments or sub segments themselves or sub sub fragments, I should say. So the success of IP, the current version of success, is very successful because it handles heterogeneous networks. So there's a lot of pluses to this. It accommodates changes in hardware technology because it can store almost anything. If you think about the concept, if you're putting the frame inside of the IP packet, it could be a frame of any type. So IP is very universal. Handles extreme increases in scale, which is great, great for the internet. The motivation for change is well, the limited addressing. So only 32 bits in an IP4. Uh, so service to new internet applications, audio and video, uh, we need bigger, bigger packet sizes, essentially. More complex addressing and routing capabilities would be nice. So along came IP6. So IP6, current IP version is IP4. New version be become, became known as IP6, which is the latest and greatest. Retains many of the design features of the four. It's connectionless. It doesn't rely upon a constant connection like uh, the current one does. That does not is either. Uh, basic datagram functions. Features like the destination address, independent routing, and maximum number of hops is retained. The new features of IP4, IP6 are the address size. So now we're looking at an IP address size that contains 128 bits instead of 32. So header format, completely different from IP4. So we have extension headers. So headers inside of headers. We nest headers in headers now, and we have bigger header size. So it encodes information to separate headers. Supports audio and video, because now we can hold more information about the particular data that's in there. So IP6 includes a mechanism that allows the sender and the receiver to establish a high quality path. And Extensible protocol does not specify all possible protocol features. It leads to a lot of flexibility to the implementer. So now we can have um, a very um, specialized um, audio streaming, uh, video streaming over your cell phone. As an example, using an IP6 network, we can have DVD movies show up instantly. And uh, it's more so not necessarily the 4G versus the 3G. It's the protocol that they're using to transmit the audio and the video in the IP6 header format that's being used to streamline the delivery and the receiving of that particular message. So if you combine all that together, we're looking at a faster network speed and we're looking at more video and audio multimedia capabilities. I'm sending pictures as an example or sending uh, lots of data. So IP6, the base header format it's twice as large as the IP4 header, but contains less information, so it's, it's easier to look at. So it doesn't make it doesn't slow it down. It contains less information, but it's bigger, so it allows you a little bit more flexibility in terms of its use. And then we can also put multiple headers in there. So the standard specifies a unique value for each one of the possible header types. Receiver uses the next header field to determine uh, what follows. So it's sort of like an outline. You start at one level of the header, it goes to the next level of the header, and then down to the next level of the header, until it finally gets done reading all the headers. So the value corresponds to data, the receiver passes the datagram to the software. And it's done, actually, at that point. So IP6 uh, software knows the end of the header because some of the header types are fixed in size, so it knows when to go at the end. It also has some padding and has some special areas in there for uh, customization. So variable size, extension headers. Headers must uh, contain sufficient information to determine whether the header actually ends so that the routers can understand it and use it. So fragmentation, reassembly, and the path, uh, MTUs. The IP6 uh, places a field in a separate fragment extension header. So we can have more information about the fragments. So we have fewer, hopefully, fewer lost fragments. 
maybe, um, you know, more reliability. The presence of the header identifies the data as a fragment. So we know that there is a fragment portion of the header now. This is this is a fragment. This is a fragment. This is a fragment. So it's better address. It's better addressing scheme to account for fewer lost packets than the IP4 scheme. The sending host is responsible for the fragmentation. The host learns the MTU along the path of the destination, and it can adjust it instead of fixing the size. So the size of these little datagram packets can actually adjust. So if you've got a network that can handle larger traffic, then you actually are able to customize the protocol um, so that it sends larger pieces of information, which you're going to need for audio and visual. I mean, the audio video, actually. In an IP4 network, you can't auto adjust it. So if you're running on an IP4 network, it doesn't really matter if you've got, you know, the fastest speed in the world. Packets are always going to show up in the same, it's always going to be the same number of packets. It's always going to show up in the same, um, hopefully in the same order. It's all, hopefully all of them are going to show up. But it's fixed on a, to, it's optimized to work on a slower speed network. On an IP6 environment, it can adjust the MTU automatically. So it can learn the MTU along the path of the destination, reassemble, and make them bigger. The fewer number of packets that you're sending, the more reliable it is, the faster it's going to get there. You know, it's kind of like if you put a house out with a bunch of buckets versus a hose, <laughs> or one huge bucket that puts out the fire versus 15 million little buckets. It's going to take longer for the little buckets to put the fire out than it is for the big bucket or the hose, actually. So that's what IP6 gave video, gave audio video. Better streaming, faster delivery of those packets. Purpose of the multiple headers on the IP6 networks, it separates out the extension headers because it improves economy and extensibility. It makes it you can, so you can extend the protocol, customize it to add your own header format in there. Um, partitioning the diagram packet uh, functionally to separate headers saves space generally. And reducing the diagram size also reduces the bandwidth consumed. In terms of extensibility, adding a new feature to a protocol is an example. There's no reason why you can't come out with your own protocol packet. Uh, why do you want to use TCP? You can come out with my TCP or something new. As long as it's compatible with TCP and it runs on a TCP network, you know, you're, you've got your own protocol. So a lot of the advancements in terms of the IP6 movement or the push towards a more flexibility, more extensibility, is to encourage more growth in terms of those protocols. TCP has been around since the beginning. Still, it's the same thing. It's not actually a standard, believe it or not. TCP is not standardized, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, exit, excuse me, existing protocol headers can remain unchanged, and the new next header type is defined, as well as the new header format. So. In terms of the addressing scheme, it assigns a unique address for each one of the connections between the computers and the physical router, same thing as IP4 does, and addresses do not have defined classes. So we got rid of the classes. So, um, the addresses of the IP4 use the class designation because of different applications, and it meant something. It doesn't really mean anything anymore. Get rid of it. So we don't, we don't actually have the class designation in an IP6. So each IP6 address is one of three basic types. We have a unicast, a multicast, or an anycast type. So we got rid of classes, we created types instead. Unicast corresponds to a single computer. Uh, multicast corresponds to a set of computers, possibly at many different locations. And then anycast corresponds to a set of computers that are shared by common address prefixes. Or an example of this would be it's a cloud, it's a virtual network. It's a multicast. It's coming from many different computers or any cast. doesn't really matter where it's coming from. So it allows a little bit more flexibility in terms of modern day uh, networking environments. The IP6 colon hexadecimal notation is very similar. The colon hexadecimal notation compact uh, syntax form for each one of the groups is a 16 bit is written in a hexadecimal with a colon separated by groups. Here's an example here. So zero compression replaces a sequence of zeros with two colons. So any IP6 address that contains uh, that begins with 96 zero bits contains an IP4 address in a low order 32-bit. So we can close the IP 
IP4 with the IP6 address, make it compatible. In terms of the best effort syntax and error detection techniques, IP defines the best effort communication service, uh, which diagrams can be lost, duplicated, delayed. Same, same kind of concept as what we talked about, I talked about earlier in terms of IP4. IP attempts to avoid errors and report problems. There's a, it's a managed protocol to some certain point. We can log errors, we can actually troubleshoot issues. A header checksum is used to detect transmission errors. The checksum is verified to ensure that the header arrived intact, hopefully. So we can run uh, checks on the packets, do checksums on it to make sure it's actually good. If it occurs, the diagram must be discarded immediately uh, without any further processing if an error does occur. So in terms of the internet control message protocol, ICMP, um, the protocol itself that IP uses to send error messages. And so what 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 we've done here is I finished up the IP4 versus IP6 comparison. You may use this information for the assignment that you have that's going to compare IP4 with IP6 is where you're going to get the data from. That's what I just covered actually. In terms of what IP offers for error detection and control, that's this protocol. So all of these different protocols are broken out into different names and they're all divided out separately because you can use Internet control message protocol with IP packets, and you can also use it with a combination of TCP and other kind of protocols. So the formal name is the ICMP message. So the protocol that IP uses to send air messages. Not to do the logging, but to send air messages themselves. So it uses this when it sends an air message and it transports the message itself. There's codes associated with it, depending upon what happened. So the air message itself, we have the source quench, so sent by a router that has no more buffer space available. Now the router's full, so it might send a message back to say, because TCP, especially over IP, and the IP is providing this message control for the TCP, TCP is going to read this message and say, it didn't work, the router is full, so send it again, and then the router should hopefully reroute it to another router, or the path would hopefully be fixed the second time. Or you can just keep pounding the router with messages, and you're going to get a series of, of error messages coming back from this protocol. Time exceeded. Uh, so the send, send by the router, if it reduces the time to live, field to zero. So the timed out didn't make it fast enough. Sent by the host to reassemble the timer. The re reassembly timer expired. It didn't get all the pieces that it expected, so it couldn't assemble the packet. The destination was unreachable. It was a bad bad choice of the destination perhaps. Maybe a redirection occurred and the router asked the host to change its route because it didn't work out. There's some, Somebody's down or something. And maybe a parameter problem. One of the parameters specified is incorrect. So these are some of the information that comes out or gets delivered by the ICMP. In terms of the transport of these messages, it's placed in the data area of the IP datagram. So the IP datagram is actually self-identifiable through this. And TCP reads this out and says, oh, bad packet, <laughs> usually. Resend, you know, so it'll automatically think on its own. So the messages are created in response to a datagram, and either the datagram has a problem or it carries a, an IPCM request message to which the router replies, and or the message causes an error, no error message is actually being sent, but the, but the itself, there was a, an error that was caused the message itself caused the error. So using the messages, you can ping. Ping uses the ICMP echo request and reply. So when you've, if you've ever executed a ping, you know, you type in the word ping space, this is a command prompt, uh, then the IP address of a computer, you want to go see if it's in the connection. You're using ICMP because you're going to get any messages back that say, hey, unreachable or timed out. Those are messages that are coming back out of ICMP. I see MP rides on an IP network, and it's there automatically for you. Trace routes also use the IP, ICMP to uh, construct a list of routers. You can run a trace route command, actually, and see the list of routers between point A and point B. So this is what a lot of network professionals do when they're trying to troubleshoot a connection. 
you're saying, why, why is this computer not responding? Or why are the messages not going through correctly? Traceroute is actually kind of nice for that. Also, it, Traceroute sets the time to live values to extract the IP addresses of the routers. And Traceroute forces many different problems, faces many different problems. Diagrams can be lost, duplicated, or delivered out of order. Routers can change dynamically. There might be some issues. So uh, Traceroute uses UDP, uh, user-defined protocol, not uh, unreliable data protocol. <laughs> so when the time to live is large enough uh, to reach this destination. And the path MTU can be determined by the messages themselves and the diagram size is fixed. So. That, believe it or not, is everything you probably maybe have learned from your previous course in networking. However, it does relate to this course as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks when we start looking at um, the Java naming convention and all of the different features that are associated because these are the underlying protocols that are working with the services that the EE edition is giving us in terms of all of its higher level APIs um, for networking. Because we are running Java over an IP network and it is looking at the data RAM packets and it's looking at the traffic and it's actually performing a lot of these uh, functions um, under the hood, I should say. And the reason why we choose Java EE is because we don't necessarily want to know the int intricate details of the header and what the router is doing and why the router is transferring it certain ways. So anyone who creates a middleware application deals with this from an underlying implementation perspective. And then anyone who deals an with an application or builds an application that works on top of the middleware never gets to see any of this stuff, actually, <laughs> because it's all hidden underneath the middleware. So. Long story short, this is everything you ever wanted to know about the internet, actually. And believe it or not, there is an assignment on this. It is the IP4 versus IP6, which is one of your upcoming assignments. So, Next week, I believe, we're getting into maybe JSP, I believe. We're going back to Java next week. So this is our slight break in terms of networking concepts. It might be JSP. It might be something else. Um, I believe servlets are on the menu coming up soon. So. We seem to be going through it. It seems like this class is flying at the speed of light, but we'll see. Thank you for attending, and I will see you next week for more exciting Java topics.